And so we have a, a intertribal presence here, even though this film is uh, about the Crazy Mountains and the Crow tribe's relationship to that range. Uh, I think it opens up an opportunity for us to talk about all of the, the, the different ranges and the relationships that all of the different tribes have outside of their reservation boundaries, the present day reservation boundaries. So, so just a little bit of background on that. Um, I, my name is Shane Doyle. Uh, I am a member of the Crow Tribe. Uh, I am a uh, researcher and uh, cultural consultant here in Bozeman and uh, uh, collaborate with a lot of different uh, NGOs and uh, as well as the university. I work for the university as a researcher and, and different groups around uh, the nation and region for educational purposes. And very happy to collaborate with uh, the Montana Wilderness Association was one of our big supporters that allowed the, uh, thank you. So thankful for their support in allowing the Crow Tribe to, to get our voice out there. And when the panel uh, gets underway, we'll, we'll be able to hear those voices. Uh, we have representation here from the uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Office, so we're very thankful for that. Uh, but before we get underway, before we show the film, uh, I had a request from one of the Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, uh, one of the uh, Upsalagat Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, uh, Johnny Tim Yellowtail, uh, who came over today, and he has uh, made a song. He was gifted with a song, and uh, he wants to, to, sh to share it with us. Uh, and the song, I believe, is about the Crow Tribe. So he was inspired to create this song, and very thankful that we'll be able to hear it this evening. sitting up here and um, uh, I'm just really it's always a great honor for me to hear uh, my peers here uh, and my elders uh, my older sister there Federica uh, and her opinions and uh, and the uh, knowledge that they have so just to kind of start uh, the panel off here um, uh, we had a few questions that we wanted to to uh, introduce 
But I'm going to kind of change around the order here because I want to start off with, uh, with the question, what makes the Crazy Mountains an important place to you personally? And the reason why I want to start off with that is because, um, and I think you could probably raise the lights at this point. Um, when I came in uh, this evening, uh, I encountered a young lady, a uh, young crow lady, who shared with me a, a real beautiful story about how her name uh, came from the Crazy Mountains and her grandfather named her after fasting there. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting, you know, because uh, I fasted around there uh, in about 1993. And uh, just this past summer, uh, I was asked by my sister to uh, name her daughter, uh, give her a, a Hapsalaga name. And so I took my, I took the experience that I had there in the Crazy Mountains when I fasted there many years ago uh, to give to, to her name. And so I took that medicine that I received in the range and passed it to my niece this summer. So then this evening when I heard that this young lady, uh, her name also comes from there, uh, I just thought, wow, that's really, really awesome. And I asked her if she would share the story. She didn't uh, share with me what her name was. Um, and uh, so I'd like to kind of hear more about that. Um, are you out there somewhere? Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is um, Baby Burnett. I am a direct descendant of uh, Chief Burnett, son of Chief Balrock, the Crow Tribe. Um, when I was younger, my grandpa Tommy, he went up to the Crazy Mountains and he fasted. Um, and my mom asked um, if he could give me my crow name. And it's Oahawa Wagon Chugish. And it, the English translation is Praise on the Highest Mountain. And I've never been into the crazies. Um, it's been a dream of mine for many years to go up there and fast and pray, and just to be in a place where so many leaders before me fasted and prayed. And every time, I'm really thankful that I go to school here in Rosemary because every time that I go home and come back, I get to pass those mountains that gave me my name. And I always, I'm so really thankful for them. And I really hope that it doesn't turn into like some place that will be desecrated by, you know, cars and and that would just that would really, really hurt me to, to see that. Um, but yeah, those mountains are something that means a lot to me. And um, I got to work over the summer with Hubert Tuligans and last spring I was going through a lot, but you know, creator said, hey, it's time to come home and listen to stories about those mountains. And I learned so much about those mountains and I'm really thankful for them. Oh. Oh. Uh -huh. Don't fight over the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to step in and slap somebody's hand. <laughs> you notice how I got past all the way down? <laughs> okay, well, um, my name is Fredrika Left Hand. Uh, Balaja Babukhiwayahuk. That my Indian name, my crow name is uh, Otter Woman. And so it's funny that, um, or an honor, I guess, that my brother asked me to be on this panel tonight uh, because, uh, you know, like you all saw that Chief Plenty who's um, fasted there, had these visions there, and not very many people know this, but um, Chief Plenty who's, his mother's name was Wapukhtiwia, and that means otter woman, okay? And so with his vision of our Crow people, uh, becoming educated, becoming the white man's equal and not their victim. Um, the reason I'm here tonight or today is uh, I just found out less than an hour ago that I will be walking across the stage and becoming Dr. Left Hand. Okay, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to call the kids now. We're all going to celebrate. <laughs> wow, wonderful. So awesome. <laughs> Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Spears. I am a resident here in the Gallatin Valley for the past 15 years. Um, 
I was asked tonight to be a, a participate and be a, a panel member um, to share a little bit about um, the history that I have with the mountains uh, that we call Jesca um, in, in our uh, Lakota language. You know, Ihani, us and, and uh, the Dapsalaga people, we, we have a rich history. You know, not only not only of uh, within the last 150 years, but in the last thousands of years. You know, Ihani, we we were all one people a long time ago. We were all we were all Midake. We were relatives. We, uh, just like all of the, the native people of, of this Upper Plains area, you know, we, we were all a, a big family, Midaki. And, and those mountains, uh, we, which we call Aliaska or Cheska, which means uh, the, white, the white mountains or the white uh, cliffs, um, I wanted to uh, expand a little bit on, on what they mean to me and why I think that they should be preserved. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of our, our history that um, is known today uh, throughout the academic community and, and our young people has happened within the last 150 years, 200 years, which is a complete change of, of uh, our, our humanity and uh, where we uh, thought we would be in, in this time. So these mountains are representative not only of, of uh, our ancestors of our, our grandmas and our grandpas who have passed on, who gave their lives so that we can have a history, so we can have a, an identity. You know, um, the spiritual center for the Lakota people is the Chesapa, which is the Black Hills. And when I compare that to, you know, what could happen to the crazy mountains or uh, it makes my heart uh, Hurt. It makes it makes me sad because of what could possibly happen to to uh, a place of such spiritual integrity and importance to to not only the Absalaka but to everyone, you know. And and the importance of knowing where you come from is something that that is priceless. That uh, imagine you as a people or as a person in each individual uh, not knowing where you came from or who you are, you know that that would mess with your mind that wouldn't be, you wouldn't be at peace or you wouldn't be able to, uh, we, we say to have a strong mind knowing where you come from so you can plan your future, your path. So when, when I think of these mountains, you know, I, it brings back a lot of stories, it brings back a lot of, uh, of uh, um, times when my grandfather told me about people traveling in, in these mountains, not only here but all the way up through, all the way into Canada. There's, they're uh, uh, sacred to our people. We went on top of these mountains and we used the mountains to, to find ourselves, to cry for a vision, to uh, find our, our identity, to uh, maybe be given a sacred dream or a path to follow, to help our people, to help ourselves, to become one with Makoche Wakan. Um, our spirit needs that. Our, our people need that. We need these mountains. We need these, these places so that we can continue to be who we are. Our prophecies have all come true. All of our medicine people have foretold of the time when, when we would be one people together here, when, when the fighting would be no more and we would all live in square houses. So, you know, we, we all wear the same clothes now. We all wear skin and hair and we all wear majita. We all come from one blood, we all come from one people. Even you come from a tribe. So, so these, these, these places are <coughs> that important to our people. Cheska, I have stories of our grandfathers, my grandpas, using these mountains all the way up into Canada as a place of refuge, as a place of, of serenity, a place to call home, a place to, uh, to rest, a place to find refuge away from everything else from the rest of the world because we hardly have any more places like that that are untouched and, and for someone to uh, stand up I, you know, I commend my, my brothers here and my sisters for, for making such a powerful film and for standing up and being the voice of Mother Earth so that we can continue to, to uh, have a place like that to call home, a place to pray, a place to continue to respect 
So imagine if you didn't know where you come from and you have no connection to the land or whatever, you would be lost. So if, if we allow that to happen, you know, we, we perpetuate the, the, uh, the tearing of our souls from who we all are. We all come from the earth, all of us. Oh. Oh, man, power. Kahi. Nope. Oh, how am I? Bach, Bach, Ashim. You allow me. But you can choose, that's the. Oh, how is it? Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is <coughs> Adrian Bird Jr. Vijay Aganish is my Indian name, which which uh, was given to me by my grandfather Joe Higgins, which means Buffalo Rider. But um, I represent the uh, Crow Tribe Tribal Historic Preservation Office, and. Uh, when I was asked by Shane, I had to sit back in that chair in the office and think about what I was just asked, you know, I was just proud. I was just proud to reply back to him. I was like, heck yeah. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> it was their prayers that we're still here. I see my brothers here, my sisters here. You know, I'm, we're the next generation to stand up for this the sacred mountain. And I'm, I'm proud that, that we're up here today to let you know that how, how sacred this mountain is to, to the Psalaga, Biwaga. And you know, I was thinking back about all the things that went on, that took place on top of that mountain. Tying up your horse at the bottom of that mountain and walking up for an answer, you know. I was thinking about all these things that they went through. You saw on the slides, it says 1851, that treaty. Not, not too long after that, Haiku went up to the mountain to fast and pray. We later found out that, you know, their their visions were, to, that were spoke about was, they saw the spotted buffalo, the puffing snake, the iron bird, 30 years later, all these visions had come to pass. The Pacific Railroad came through here in the 1980s, 1880s. And these were the things that I sat back to think about, you know, I was just proud to come back up into Bozeman. I'm a, a, a anthropology major here. And uh, I'll be soon, hopefully, wrapping it up. But uh, I'm doing some <laughs> research. <laughs> Upon my, uh, my study, my field of study, I like being out there, checking out all these sacred sites that those ones that before us had, you know, talked about. But what I look for is the things that haven't been shared yet. So, you know, coming, coming back over this way, it always feels good to look at that mountain. Give me my little boy, grab the phone and here, take a picture. <laughs> Driving down the road and the camera's right here trying to take a picture of the, little, the crazy mountains. Even our little ones know how sacred that is without them, us telling them. It's just in the blood, it's just in the genes. You know, when we talk about we talk about this mountain, how sacred it is. You know, I, it just takes me back to back when they were warriors. You know, how we looked at the, the significance to this mountain, to the Crow tribe. In Indian terms, we looked at it as our, our fort. Back in the day, when the cavalry were chased back, they ran to a fort with the crows. That was our safe, our safe haven, our fort. You know, I, these mountains, they're sacred enough to where, you know, if we explained it all to you, you wouldn't understand it. It takes, you know, a good heart to look at what, what these mountains really mean to us Native Americans. 
you know, I was really honored. I'm really honored to be up here to stand up for, for these mountains, to be the next generation because there's these little ones here that are going to one day be here, right? We're, we're sitting and it's going to go on, on and on and on. And I'm just proud. All the stories that we share today about that mountain, it's just the voices that have been talked about. The individual that was talked about. The individual was fasting. All until now today, we're here. We're talking about it. We're sharing it. We're witnesses of it. My people. And I'm honored, and I'm truly honored to be sitting in front of you today to tell you about how sacred it is. And I know just this is who I'm going to do. No, how is you know, they would go to the, they would, they would get to as close as the, to the Creator as possible to reach that answer. All the way down to Wyoming, those high peaks, Tetons. All the way up this way, from the Wolf Mountains to the Bighorns. There are many, many fasting beds, as rugged as the bear twos are. You will see many, many fasting beds at their peaks. All the way up into the crazies here. And, um, and that's why I'm here today, to stand up for this place. It's because of their prayers that we're here today, that we're still living, we're still breathing. It was because of what they did for us, what they said for us in their, in their prayers that we're here. And my prayers go up along with them that one day that these little ones would be sitting right here telling your grandkids about this place. It just, it's just automatic. They could tell you about it. They could talk to you about it. And, you know, I'm just thankful. Thankful and honored to even sit here and to even mention that mountain and of, and of, and of its significance to, to, the Crow, to the Crow people. This is a home we leave. Call it home. A home. A home. Chicken. My name is Johnny Tamil Tell. Uh, within the forest is my name, um, like my brother here, Adrian, uh, I worked with him for a while now. Um, I kind of want to start off in the beginning why this mountain is uh, important to me. I was raised by my grandparents, you know, I'm pretty fortunate that I was because uh, they taught me a lot. A lot of the old ways, a lot of the, the tradition, you know, especially my, my grandpa. My grandpa was uh, um, made uh, drumsticks for the Sundance, uh, the drum groups, you know, that came. You know, always taught, told me a lot about the Sundance and the stories. And, and then in our early 80s, uh, my, my mother came to school here and I was pretty much here, but a lot of times my grandparents always came and took me back to, to the res. On the way to the res, it was, it was awesome because my grandmother always told me stories all the way home. We passed that, that crazy mountains every time and she would always tell me the stories about that mountain. Just everything that, that the crows did in this area, she, all, she told me the stories, my grandfather, and every time. Uh, that, that's what I waited for when my, my grandparents came and got me and told me stories all the way home. Even, and then when, we, when they brought me back here, you know, same thing, they told me stories all the way this way. So those were uh, precious, those, you know, those times was precious to me. But like I said, all, all these stories, you know, and then after all, when I became a adult, I I took my family to uh, Wyoming. The school education on the res is not too good, so you know my, my kids weren't doing good, so I had to take them somewhere else. So we moved to uh, Paul, Wyoming. That's um, 
one of our uh, old uh, Crow land, my, my great great grandfather um, descended of uh, Chief Grey Bull, and that's where he came from, that area right there. So when I got in that, that area, you know, I, I got uh, homesick, but uh, my grandmother told me, she said, why are you homesick? I said, you're right at home. And then when I thought about it, you know, I said, man, that's true. You know, after that, I felt, you know, better. <laughs> but, you know, as time went on, you know, these, uh, like I said, these stories, you know, uh, I was thinking about them. And then I started getting into um, archaeology. And when I did a lot of, uh, went into a bunch of um, archaeology school uh, diggings. And then, you know, I, I did a lot of, a lot of work with uh, world-renowned um, archaeologist, one, one name, his name's uh, Chris Finley, and his son is uh, Judd Finley. So I worked with these guys, and they, uh, they taught me a lot. But um, uh, when I started getting into this, this field, um, right, right in uh, the, our Bighorn Mountains, you know, that's very sacred to the crows too, but it was uh, right next door to me also. I was always glad to be up on those mountains, you know, doing things, you know, doing the uh, field work up there. It was awesome, you know, but there was places that, um, you know, the, when the tourists came, you know, especially when they hiked, you know, they, they kind of uh, destroyed some of the, the artifacts up there. And, um, you know, I thought that wasn't good, you know, that's not, it's not good to do that. And a lot of the, um, we have, we have cops that are that watch, but it seems like you know. Right now, you know, everywhere there's a lot of sacred places that are um, getting destroyed. And I was like, man, what, what can I do, you know, to to help? You know, what can I do? And then I got a um, I got a phone call, and it was this guy that called me, and he said, hey man, he said you wanna you know come and work, you know, with our preservation office, and uh, I was like. You know, I jumped up because I was like, man, you know, this is right, right up my alley. I can do, do something, help, you know. So after that, I started working with uh, Adrian here. I was pretty, pretty glad to work with this guy because, you know, I, I went to school with him. You know, we large guys, you know, LG, me and this guy. So we grew up there, you know, on top of school <laughs> hill. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we were raised there and, you know, as, as like I said, when I became an adult, you know, I left. And I, I never seen this guy for, you know, a lot of years. And when he called me up and he told me, you know, to work with him, out, you know, and I, I, I jumped on it. And I said, yeah, you know, so I'm really fortunate to work with this guy and, you know, be in his position right now. Like I said, you know, this is important to me because, you know, my grandmother told me all these stories. And now is my chance, you know, to, to do something and to uh, help. And I'm just glad uh, my brothers and my sisters are here, you know, and I was like, uh, I can't say much else. And I'm just happy, glad that, you know, we're doing this. And I just hope that, you know, people will, will listen and that we'll all stand up for this mountain because, like we all said, it's very important, this mountain. So, I hope. Good evening, everybody. It's an honor to be in front of you guys. See, my name is Ishbaj Iwa Chilish. My name is he who brings good fortune with his feathered fan. It was named to me by my one of my late grandmothers, Clara Bigley. She named me because of her education. And until this day, I go to school here at MSU, and I'm fulfilling that, that name. And so, I come from Chief Fights Alone and any line shows. And all these men, you know, they all talk about prayer. And prayer is a really strong thing about these mountains and stuff about fasting. Because I come from a family where they brought the Crow Shoshone Sundance back to the Crow people. And so like in the uh, late 1800s, you know, when the Sundance was taken away from us after the religion saw it, after Catholicism seen it, and you know, my great grandfather, he had my grandpa. I was wondering why my grandpa was sick. He couldn't eat. He couldn't eat anything. And one day, you know, tried the doctors, they couldn't help him. 
And then they turned the priest and didn't help him as well. And one morning, you know, when he saw the sunrise towards the east, he unclothed him and put him in his breech cloth, raised him, and said, if you can help him, give him his strength back and have him eat. I promise I'll bring the Crow Shoshone Sundance back to the Crow people. And until that day, in a few hours came by, he actually he can start eating, he started drinking, giving his strength back. And then my great grandfather went towards Wyoming area in Fort Washakie and met that man Rainbow. And he's the one that interpreted for him. And he said, This is how we teach you. And whatever you do, don't forget there's rules to this. And you know, you know that's how he got it back. In these crazy mountains, you know, there's two words to it, you know. Awahawapia. The word Awahawapia was the bad word when the government and all the controversy of all the tribes were having a bad name for it. And that's when they wanted to fight all the tribes. But the correct term for it before that, in the beginning, is called Bilishbachawi dot data, meaning that he doesn't help us. And that is the correct term for it. Anyways, I've known about this a lot, you know, because of my grandfather, even all the stories he's told so far, you know. And in 1851, you know, it's when the treaty, it's when that still sits there. Um, but, you know, all these stories, you know, they all help us, they all shape us the way who we are as a state, you know. And they keep you know, going on and on, that's how we preserve all these stories on all these grounds. And even, you know, a while back, I didn't even know my grandpa was telling me about just that last exit when you start leaving Bozeman heading towards Livingston. Through that pass, you know, he was telling a story about one of our one of our other fasting grounds. They called it the Man Called Mud. So these warriors kind of came around. What they would do is they'd dip themselves inside the mud and pray. And once they arise, they shapeshifted into the animal or unless they would become the trees. And that's how they prepared themselves for battle. But, you know, it's really good. I'm so, uh, so fortunate to be able to hear these stories. And I want to pass it down. Uh, we haven't heard from Lauren. Lauren, would you like to comment? Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Shane, thank for inviting me and all you on the panel. It's an honor to sit with you as well. Oki, Nitsadanago, Bita, Yakoinuan. Uh, my name is Lauren Bergrattler. My Blackfeet name is um, Eagle Pipe. I uh, received that name after uh, returning home from the Smithsonian Institution. I helped um, repatriate bundles back into the Blackfeet tribe, uh, back into use. So as we think about um, how we utilize our, uh, the practice of who we are as Native people to really inform modern management concepts, we're working on many of those pieces, um, both here at the Montana State University and at the Blackfeet Nation. So I have the, the uh, very good honor of wearing two hats this evening. Uh, one as an agriculture resource planner for the Black Sea Tribe, and the second as the endowed chair for the Native Studies Department here at Montana State University. And so both of those things are very important as we think about how we, um, again, inform public um, uh, or uh, management concepts that are really informed by the practice of who we are as Native people. So we've utilized um, Public Law 103, uh, anyways, the American Indian Agricultural Resource Management Act of 1993. And if you look at that federal legislation, it really puts tribes in a tremendous place to play a much larger role in not only their homelands, but also in the practice of their treaty rights, their reserved rights um, uh, across the country. So as you look at uh, maps of, of, of uh, tribes across the country, and then you add their reserved treaty rights, um, uh, those maps become about 10 times larger when you think about the spaces that we really um, have the opportunity to influence in terms of public lands management. So a lot of the work that we're doing at the Blackfeet Nation and here at Montana State University is to begin to reclaim that space as we move away from the delivery systems that have been created by uh, straight profitability, when we think about commercial food production, conservation, all of those things, it puts us in a position as tribal governments to really play a much larger role in how we manage public lands. 
So when we think about Herrera versus uh, Wyoming, the latest uh, Supreme Court decision that upheld the treaty rights of hunting in traditional um, uh, uh, treaty territory, we can utilize that as a legal precedence and a foundation to really play a much larger role in how we manage public lands. And so when we think about that, and we think about uh, some of the benchmarks or some of the work that has already been done by tribes, you can look at the Umatilla tribe who has um, uh, worked with the Forest Service to map um, uh, traditional foods on public lands mm -hmm. and, um, and protect that information uh, that will uphold uh, or uh, withstand a FOIA request so that uh, natives can regain access to those traditional foods. So as we look at our traditional life ways and the practice of who we are, it doesn't matter whether it's hunting, harvesting of, of wild, um, uh, wild anything, right? Sustainability is already built in. So as you transfer that right to actually do that, you're teaching the, the sustainability that comes with the harvesting of those foods, of those animals, whatever it may be. So as we think about uh, uh, taking those practices and dusting them off and moving them forward in a modern context, it really puts tribes squarely in a place where we can have a much larger influence on not only those public lands and the way that they're managed, but also the preservation of biodiversity within those spaces. We know that the reclamation of, um, of many of those um, commercial systems, right, that are, that are driven by, uh, as we think about federal legislation and even the regulations behind the implementation of that legislation, uh, uh, large corporations have had a huge influence in the way that that goes. So you look at uh, even GMOs, Right, you know, if um, uh, you get cross-pollination, you find this um, uh, genetically modified species in your crop, um, uh, the large corporation come in and seize your entire crop. So as we think about reclaiming that space for small farmers, ranchers, um, uh, individual people, um, uh, some of that federal legislation really gives tribes broad latitude to play a much larger role in um, influencing uh, how we manage those spaces. Not only through the eyes of native people, but also through the methodologies for harvesting. So if we're going to dust off those practices and pull them forward in a modern context, it gives tribes the opportunity to really redefine that space. Wow. Thank you so much. You know, for each and every one of you too, I hope we take home some good medicine tonight. So the next question uh, I think I'll bring to the panel um, is one that you might, you know, kind of think about a little bit and reflect on. Um, how should we balance protecting sacred sites on public land and the threat of the public discovering and desecrating them? So what do we want, do we want to, how do we want to approach that conundrum? <laughs> First of all, I, I personally, I think we need to take the, the, the whole conundrum part out of it and, and humanize it. And, and it's, you know, it's not it's not out of reach. It's it's a, um, a problem that does have a solution. You know, and we're, when we talk about uh, about our, our sacred lands and our our stories, you know, we we it, it almost seems like we you know we reach back and we're talking about something that used to be and 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 something that you know we're all here still. We're here together, and we're talking about, about, about living, sustainability, about the future, about health, about energy. You know, um, I, I think it all starts in the individual, in the mind, in the body. You know, try, try it sometime. Go by yourself. Go to one of these places and, and pray. And, and it's not only about the wahunupa, not only about the two-legged. It's about the wingi. It's about... The Wahutopa, about the four-legged, it's about the worm, it's about everybody, you know, this land belongs to everybody, to all the Wamakashka, the animal nations, to the people, to the ones who fly above us. So, you know, in, in thinking on a, on a spectrum, you know, not only from lands that have been taken or public lands, no, this is all of our land, this is all of, we all have to live here together. So, so by, by taking the, the, you know, this is yours and this is mine and this is, hers and his and, and, and making it this is ours. I think that's a concept that we can all, you know, start and grasp mm -hmm. a little bit, right? By reclaiming our, our connection to to the you know, the, the inchworm, to the to the, the bird, the, to the tree, to the grass, because we need those. We need those. We need everything, every part of it. It's not all of Unchimaka, all of Mother Earth is meant for us to say, you know. <laughs> 
for us to we, to touch every part of it or to, to have it all for us. And, you know, it all has roots in greed and want and, and you know, industrialization and, and commercialism and making money and profit. And, you know, we're going to profit from leaving it alone, mm -hmm. from, from having a space. So when we think about methodology and planning, you know, it's very important to have you know, your stakeholders at the table as you think about planning in those spaces. But I absolutely agree. You know, as we think about uh, and move into that space, you know, um, uh, you know, in our in our planning, you know, we're um, in the middle of a feasibility study to create two Blackfeet conservation areas. One in the form of a tribal park, the second in a, a national prairie land designation. The, the park portion will serve as a broad reintroduction of the E and E for the bison back into the wild. So as we think about uh, the, uh, about that type of planning, and the first thing that we did was went to our elders and brought our elders together and, and had conversation around the e and &E, right? And what it meant um, uh, to the life ways of Blackfeet people, our Blackfoot Confederacy people. I'm Scott Pizagani, Southern Blackfeet, right? You know, and so, um, but we always kept an empty chair open to represent that e and &E so that we were reminded as we're doing the planning that it's up to us as humans to, to, to be the spokesperson for the E and E, right? Because if we forget about him, right, you know, then why will he want to reintroduce himself? Why will he want to come back and be a part of our life ways again? You know, and so as we think about that in a, in a, in a broader context, I absolutely agree. When we think about the water, when we think about the, the earth, when we think about the animals, we think about the plants, we think about the people, right? You know, it's up to us you know, since we're so intelligent, right, right, they actually um, have consideration for all those four other, um, those four other living beings, right? The water does live, right? Well, life does start with water. The earth does live, right? You know, it's what gives us our nourishment, right? Animals and plants do live, right? You know, and it's up to us to recognize that, and, and it's up to us to, to ensure that they're at the table as we have these discussions. And if we're able to do that, then we're able to plan from a much more holistic perspective that really recognizes all of the interdependent functions and relationships and systems planning, right, in an ecosystem, rather than just thinking about ourselves and how we can profit off the land. If we're able to do that, we can create higher profitability from that land. And so, um, so I absolutely agree with you. Thank you. signed an agreement that, that they should in, in, ensure the Crow tribe that at any time that there's going to be development in, around, the summit, whatever, that they will be notified. And, you know, we, we've been doing some backtracking and uh, I think that's kind of where we should start on protecting and balancing out this whole, you know, ordeal with what's going on, working together. Because we're here too. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, uh, oh. All I have to say is uh, I agree with all of you all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have much to say about you know because these guys pretty much you know said everything. Uh, my grandfather always told me if you don't have nothing to say, don't say it because it will make a fool out of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not gonna say anything because you know, you know everything. Oh. Oh. 
Can I take this lady for 400, please? <laughs> yes. Don't forget to uh, announce your uh, answer in the form of a question. <laughs> Yeah, just whatever topic. I think we could probably open it up at this point. Um, you know, if you want to speak to that question, uh, another uh, there's some other great issues that, that that we could take on here as well. Uh, what role should treaty rights play in the management decisions of the Crazy Mountains or other public lands? Um, you know, at one time the whole state of Montana was all designated as Indian country in official reservations. Uh, there was no uh, gaps between the reservations. It was border to border. And uh, the only place that really was not designated as one specific tribal area was this Gallatin Valley. So, um, and then this was designated as a common hunting ground for all of the, of the groups that, uh, that were in the region. So if you look back on Montana, there really, uh, the history of Montana has always been Indian country, uh, both legally and culturally. And so I, I think it's a good question. I think it's an important question. Uh, to at least make a statement on um, what role should treaty rights play in the management decisions, uh, like you know the Forest Service, uh, who is the major, uh, uh, I guess, decision maker in all of this. Um, what do you guys think about that? Any any thoughts on that one, Denison? You're holding the ball. The ball's in your court. <laughs> well, the way the treaty rights should actually be is that, you know, for hundreds of years, you know, ever since before we were put on reservations, you know, that we all, most of our chiefs all sat down with, you know, the government. And, you know, and as crows, you know, we were co-founded on tobacco, and that's how we became friends with the government in the first place, you know, is that all these other tribes, you know. Um, you know, that's how the Forest Service should actually obey by the treaties, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to elaborate a little bit about, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that, like I said, I think, you know, the, the treaties and the, the Forest Treaty, I think they they should do that too, you know. But just the, the, man, the treaty rights, um, I think they're all messed up, you know, because they, they broke all of them. You know, when my uh, my grandfather, you know, uh, his name was Robert Yellowtail, mm -hmm. and he was uh, one of the ones that um, fought for the, the, the Yellowtail Dam and the reservation. Back then, you know, I didn't I didn't realize that it was it was that bad, you know, because back then, you know, um, I was even um, there yet, you know, but uh, as I as I grew up, you know, I did a, a lot of research. I talked to my uh, Yellowtail family, and uh, you know they told me that when my grandfather fought for that dam. You know, he wanted uh, he went with the, he, he did a meeting with the the government, and at the time my grandfather said that he said after 50 years he said um, this dam will belong to the Crow Nation. He said, and they they agreed on this. So as time went on, you know, the government broke, broke that treaty, you know, and they said, no, you know, and now, you know, the crows, we don't even get no, nothing out of that dam, no revenue, you know, nothing. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it, was, it was pretty sad because when, I, when, they, when they broke that, you know, it pretty much uh, split the reservation. The river crows and uh, mountain crows were against each other, you know, were the same, you know, were crows, but because of, because of that, the, the, the dam, you know, my um, grandfather was a mountain crow, so his crew, you know, they wanted to stop that, and they wanted to, they didn't want to have the dam, but at the time, the, the chairman of the, the crow tribe, he was listening to my grandfather, but all of a sudden, he, he followed uh, his uh, his followers. So whoever he, his advisor was, you know, they they went with the, the money. So they you know they once they got the money, you know, everything got messed up. So with me, the trees, and I, you know, I think they're all a bunch of baloney to me. So. <laughs> Yeah, 
treaty rights. Um, you know, the question or the, the topic says what role should treaty rights play in the management decisions? You know, they should take precedence. They should say they should, that should be everything. You know, Ihani, that's what our, our, our family died for, for, for an agreement to fight no more over these lands. You know, and, and if, if I'm going to be honest with myself and, and you know, who, who I am and where I come from, then, you know, I, I believe they should be upheld. I believe they should, should have a precedence, that they should have a power, that they should give the power back to the treaties. You know, and even, even a long time ago, the, the translation of the treaties was, was misunderstood, you know, because they didn't speak of Salak, Lakota, Lakfi any of the, you know, the languages, and they use that to their advantage to say, you know, this is, th this is mine now. You can go ahead and live here, but I, I have say over, over where you live, you know. We're the only people who still have to carry a card to prove who we are and where we come from under the Bureau of Land Management and, and the BIA. So, you know, to me, that, that's a, just a, a, a gross misrepresentation of, of uh, you know, a handshake or, a, or something, a promise or a, an agreement. So I, I think they should take precedence or we should, you know, we, we have the power to, to, to give the power back because, you know, ultimately, you know, we can say all we want, but, uh, you know, there's that group on that sits in that White House that, that <laughs> has say over, over what happens. So, uh, you know, I, I, I would give the power back to the people. Well, I'm going to say some things are going to make you a little bit uncomfortable, and I certainly am going to apologize ahead of time. Right? You know, but uh, but the first is that you know uh, when we think about the stereotypes about tribes and tribal governments and their inability to manage natural resources, all of that, we need to get out, out away from that, right? Even for our own people, we need white validation, right? You know, uh, uh, a non-native firm can come into Indian country and be paid market value, right? But will nickel and dime native professionals that are doing the same work, that are knowledgeable, that have traditional ecological knowledge, all of that. So as we think about traditional ecological knowledge and the, you know, and, and balance that against the need for white validation, we need to remove that stereotype and, and recognize some very key facts. So one of them is that as you look across the globe, right, you know, and you look at indigenous spaces, it makes up about 25% of the land mass across the globe. You look at the biodiversity in those spaces, it's 80% of the biodiversity that exists across the globe, right? You know, so uh, non-native spaces, 75% of the land mass, 20% of the biodiversity, right? So as we look at intact ecosystems and we look at where those intact ecosystems reside, they reside in Indian country, right? You know, so what does that say about public lands? It says that we're actually managing our lands much better. Doesn't it? Right? to begin to, to include uh, traditional ecological knowledge, you know, because that is $15,000 that we know of, right? 15,000 years of, um, of, of uh, uh, methodology, right? We need to utilize Western science to substantiate that methodology, not allow Western science solely to dictate um, uh, uh, new methodologies, right? All we have to do is, again, dust off those practices, bring them forward, allow them to, to manifest in a modern context, right? Then we will get sustainability, then we will get profitability. Democracy comes from Native people, right? You know, our forefathers, they visited the Iroquois, right? You know, representative democracy comes from Native people, right? You know, you have the longhouse, right, which was uh, population distribution. That's how many seats you had at the table, right? You had the chiefs, the executive branch. You had the clan mothers, you know, if there was uh, um, uh, a anything going on between those two houses, right? You know, that the clan mothers decided, the, the judicial system, the Supreme Court, right? So as we look at the, uh, what uh, natives have, uh, how, how natives have informed uh, everything today, Maslow, right, the hierarchy uh, of needs, Right comes from Blackfeet, right? You know, and it's not a hierarchy, right? It's a circle, right? You know, it's missing key pieces, right? You know, and so, you know, as we look at, you know, really um, uh, doing away with that white validation and actually allowing space for uh, native methodology to really inform modern concepts, then we'll really move into that space where tribes can play a larger role in upholding their treaty rights in public spaces. Okay. more time.
times where Let's see, <laughs> we've got about 14 minutes left and in about 10 minutes till I'm going to open it up for the audience if they have any questions. So I have four minutes? Yeah, <laughs> yeah three minutes and 50 seconds. <laughs> Okay, so um, I would say, you know, it's not rocket science. I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel about going back to the treaty rights. We can all read, we can all, you know, it doesn't have to be that hard. And I think sometimes people make things harder than they need to be. And if, you know, just like the rest of the, the panel members talk about all these stories, all these traditions, all of these, these different things that, that our people have about these different um, places, it wouldn't be that hard to make that decision if you, if you really thought about it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, just like um, Lauren brought up the Herrera versus Supreme Court, the Wyoming uh, hunting rights and that sort of thing, my dad is 70, he'll be 77 years old uh, this April, and when that case came about, he said, are they going to have a victory dance? <laughs> you know, and you know this was a this was a huge thing for him. Yeah. But you know we live less than 40 miles away from the Wyoming border. You know that sort of thing. So for us, hunting is is a big a big deal. And so you know those elk in Wyoming, they must be smart. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Stay on that side and then cross over. And, you know, but you know it. it it is, you know, I was just talking to Lauren about the, you know, the treaty rights of, of the Umatilla coming to Yellowstone National Park to come hunting. You know, they bring their, their, their people, they travel all the way from Washington to come hunt over here. And, you know, does it have to be that hard? No, it doesn't. You know, do we have to go through all of these hoops to, to, to let this group of tribal people come hunt where they used to hunt? It doesn't have to be that hard, I don't think. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think that, that was wonderful. I'm just going to take a moment. First of all, I wanted to, and I didn't get an opportunity at the beginning. We had a couple more ladies we had invited onto the panel. One of them was Sharon Paraguay, who is a state legislature and a representative from uh, the Crow Reservation. She couldn't be here tonight because she's in Helena. Uh, they had some uh, legislative meetings and dinners that she had to go to. And then uh, the other one is Perry Bowerly, who, uh, who made a cameo in, uh, in the film, and she's uh, sick with the flu. So I'm uh, hoping that she feels better soon. But, um, so I know we had kind of a guy-heavy panel here, um, and I'm glad that my cousin was able, my sister here was able to show up at the last minute. Um, but uh, now I think, let's go ahead and, is there any questions out here in the audience? Uh, Someone has itching here right away. Yep. How does wilderness designation, uh, if that's what we're advocating for for the Crazy Mountains right now, interact with, with how Crow people traditionally use the land? Would that meet the needs of, uh, of Crow people in continuing to traditionally use the, the land as they want to? And I'm going to ask Adrian to address that. Could you repeat that again? <laughs> Yeah, how does wilderness designation, if that's what we're advocating for, for the uh, crazy mountains, interact with the Crow people's traditional use of the land, and, and will it meet the needs of being able to use the land in traditional ways as, as uh, the Crow people continue to want to use it? Well, uh, when we go back home, you know, you're not going to hear anybody saying, uh, we're going to go camp at the uh, crazies, you know? That's how much we respect this mountain. Uh, it goes down to all the way to our children today, nowadays, and, and, uh, along with the respect, along with the respect that we have for this, for this area, uh, the holiness of this of this mountain, you know, is. Whenever one of our, our elders talk about this, that's it's how it's mentioned right away, right away of. Uh, uh, beginning of how he's going to talk about the sacred mountain on the Masquagasha, you know, it's always the term that they use beginning when they're going to talk about it. So how we look at it today is we, you know, we, we just don't go around it, you know. <laughs> um, the, 
significant. You know, I read up, I was reading um, in one of the archives that, you know, when they would used to uh, run, run to these mountains, that, they, that the enemy would fall, that they would fall off their horses. You know, I was looking at that, going back, and I was like, man, how powerful these, these mountains really are, you know? It's, it's just that much sacred. And, you know, I, I never heard of anybody, any of my friends that go out and hike the mountains and that are outdoors all the time have mentioned going up there or try to go up there. You know, I just, I don't know how to put it in English. <laughs> I can tell you in Crow all about it, you know. But, um... Well, the other part of that is that uh, um, uh, forest land designation versus wilderness have different management concepts. And so as you look at um, uh, uh, wilderness, there's much less access, you know, there's uh, banning of uh, vehicles, um, uh, recreational vehicles, ATVs, that kind of stuff, you know, and so, so that would create additional rest uh, restrictions around the protection of those areas. But at the very end of the day, I think that if uh, tribes just play a larger role in the management plans, you know, and it's really hard to say that because as you look at, you know, just managing your own space, you know, and you look at this additional area where you have treaty rights, the cold hard reality is that Tribal governments are dealing with the socioeconomic conditions that exist in, in, in their space as it is, right? So what ends up happening is that all of these other areas begin to become a lower priority, right? So as we think about, you know, the role of, of conservation at large, right? The role of, you know, NGOs and, and others, you know, they should really be uh, helping tribes supplement not only um, the, the scientific expertise, but also the traditional ecological knowledge that really informs the plans in those public spaces. And so, uh, so, you know, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, which um, conservation has, has primarily done, right, you know, or buy up land, right, you know, um, if they actually invest in tribes and invest in the work um, uh, and the uh, treaty rights that tribes have, you know, by providing the scientific information and all that, then we can marry that with the, um, with the traditional ecological knowledge and the, the, the practice of who we are as Native people to really inform better management of those spaces. So the short-term answer is yes, a wilderness designation is good, but it also prohibits our people from doing things like gathering and hunting. You know, um, uh, at the end of the day, you know, on the comprehensive planning side, uh, NGO, NGOs should be working with tribes to really redefine that space. That's great comments. Great comments. Uh, if I could, yeah, if I could just follow up on that as well. Um, you know, the Crow tribe has requested formally a uh, wilderness designation. The Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, uh, William Big Day, uh, we have the letter on file, you know, it's open to public record. So, the, you know, the tribe has come down, they've made a stand and they want to protect the mountains from any intrusion. And I think that the belief, uh, as was touched on in the film, is that, you know, we still have a lot of praying to do in those mountains. and. Um, you know, that's a way of life. That's a way of thinking about the world um, that uh, is real beautiful. And I think that's what brought everyone here this evening, um, is to just celebrate that beauty and to learn more about it. And, and trying to discover how we fit into that and how we can preserve it for future generations and for ourselves. And, you know, even if anyone, uh, I think someone mentioned, I think it was Michael, um, you know, even if you went up there just for eight hours and fasted. And, and you know, I think that uh, Adrian's comment, you know, basically saying, you know, the Crow people don't see those mountains as a recreational area uh, by and large. They view them as a you know, sacred uh, uh, temple or sacred place that is not there to uh, you know, go and recreate, have fun, but more of a place that's uh, meant to go and sacrifice and and uh, you know, show your commitment to becoming a better person. So I think that's uh, that's kind of what I took from that. But I think all in all, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I think all of us in here and on the panel are on the same page. You know, we 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 believe in the beauty of our traditions. They're 
they've gotten us this far, you know, uh, they, they're the reason why we're here. And we want to continue that going forward in the face of uh, the colonial machine that we've all had to endure. So I think we're, uh, we've got a few more minutes left here. Maybe one other question, yeah. Just a reminder, you know, about a year from now, our country's going to go through another transition. And I hope it will be a transition that as we cast our votes, we can think about casting those votes in a way by who we put in office and what is represented by the person in that office having a strong influence over the Forest Service Absolutely. Et cetera, et cetera. So many. So I just encourage you, please, mm. with some sense of seventh generation. Thank you. Mm. Oh, thank you, Brian. Tennyson wants to take a stab at it. <laughs> uh, not literally. Is <laughs> that, you know, when you hear these stories from the tribal member, you know, tell it the way it is. Don't sugarcoat anything from what you put on top of it, because that's the way all these stories are told and are actually told by tribal members, just like Shane here, and just like the rest of these men and women right here sitting in front of us. And so that, that's what I have to tell you, is just tell it the way we tell you. And that's what, that's what my big pit peeve is in anthropology, because mm -hmm. I minor in it. Um, and I was telling a story about the Sundance and about this one article that was kind of, my anthropologist manipulated the story. Um, you know, I decided to restructure that and point out everything that he actually told and the way how he written that story. And so I took it back to the elders and I asked them, and I said, can you please help me interpret the way you tell me? And so that way I can tell my people and tell these people that are not from here the correct way. And that's how you should actually do it with us. Mm. Awesome. Okay, Michael, you get the last word this evening. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wanted to thank everybody for coming, and and uh, you know it, it takes a little bit for for you to come and step out of your your, your box and and you know my, my me included to come and and and, and want to learn, you know and my and you know expanding on your question a little bit is is go to the source, you know instead of uh, reaching out to somebody way over there to learn about something that's right here in front of you. So I thank you guys for coming and, and, and helping to bridge that gap that some of our ancestors built, you know, and, and created. And, we're, and by doing things like this, it helps for us to, you know, be more accessible, and which in turn will help everybody to tell the truth, you know, to find that mm -hmm. truth. And, and, you know, I was listening to my, my brothers and sisters talk about, you know, over-exploiting things. You know, because it is almost in our human nature to be like, hey, come and see it, and feel it, and climb it, and taste it, and try to make some money out of it. You know? So in, in, in the essence of, of, of what our grandfathers are saying is, you know, find that respect again. And these places allow us to do that, to go and, and find ourselves again, is a place to go and be quiet because they say, 
in silence lies the truth. Mm. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, one, more, one more thing is uh, I want to share with you is uh, all these stories that we're, we're trying to explain to you are the stories that were when they came back down. When they came, when they sat up there, how many went out, how many went out, uh, out hiking without water? Oh, Anybody? Yeah, For four or five days, <laughs> seven, eight. Okay, when they reached these mountain tops, when they had received that gift, sometimes they had to uh, sacrifice that the force to the first joint that caused them to probably from pulling their bow and arrow, but they sacrificed that, and they would come back down with a with a gift, and that gift wasn't it didn't come from here. The, those were those gifts were God given strengths, even to even come back down down that mountain again without water and food. So that when they came into the village, came, came back to their, to their loved ones and sat down, these are what we're trying to tell you. These are the stories that we're trying to share with you of this place. So think about that. Just think about the, that pure, awesome joy, just the presence that they brought, that individual brought down. He had a different type of light that was upon him to come down to strengthen his, his, his family, the tribe, the, the, the war parties, the, the successful raids that they had to do to keep us surviving. And you know, that's just, that's just what's amazing, so amazing. I, I, I can't sit up here and tell you everything about this place. It's just, it's just at all, it's just something sacred. How do you explain something that's sacred? You know, how do you, but we're, we're up here to tell you about what, what has taken place up there and what this, this, uh, oh, how it holds today. You know, I just want to say thank you for having me here. I'm just, I'm just glad to even be here to even, to share this little bit about this mountain. What, what, what we, my tribe has, has, has seen up there and that, that they brought down that, that God given strength. That, that new strength that came to, to us, that, that flows through our body today. You know, I just want to kind of throw that out at, it, at you today and just kind of think about what this, this mountain really means to us. I hope, I hope. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a good day.